Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to see if I can make sure that I can yeah. share my slides with you. I think that's on right now, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Good. So I'll just close this and do this. Well, thank you very much for this uh, very nice introduction. Um, I have to admit that I've been uh, not uh, nervous, but uh, still a bit uh, like this about uh, joining this event today because I've been using a, a lot of uh, Ehrenberg's uh, uh, work in my own work. I was actually uh, deep inspired uh, by him when I did my PhD many years ago. So uh, uh, he's been one of the, 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 let's say, referring figures that I've been uh, returning to over and over again. Uh, so uh, hmm, you will see what I'll do about this today. Um, uh, you were kind enough to mention that I'm a full-time professor. Uh, I'm not yet. Uh, I'm an only an associate professor uh, at sociology, but uh, you know, hmm, uh, I think it's uh, okay. Um, if I look a bit uh, up, so to speak, like this, this because I have my presentation on another computer. Uh, at the end, it's not because I don't want to look at you, it's just because I have to uh, be aware of what I've actually read uh, for today. So um, this is how it is. And, uh, and there's, uh, I'm very sorry to interrupt, but uh, what, what we see on the screen is not mm -hmm. the, um, uh, how would you say that, the, the um, diaporama, or I, I don't know the name, but uh, the, the, the framed. So uh, I just want to be sure uh, that you don't You don't see, see my what... slides, no? We, we see the slide, but in the PowerPoint okay. program. Uh, I just want to be sure that we see what you want us to see. Yeah, so. yeah. Do, do you see the front where it says it's hardly enough to do okay, is it? Mental suffering in the performance society? Yes. Okay. Yes, but, but just maybe, uh, uh, sorry, uh, click, click, yeah. uh, just click on the following one uh, to be sure that it also changes. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sorry to have interrupted you. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. I, I, um, um, it's the first time I actually do it like this, so it's uh, it's good that you mention it. So, um, besides uh, working on uh, all of the things that uh, Nicola was mentioning right now, I actually invest uh, quite a lot of my time researching researching on grief uh, at the moment. Uh, and why is that? Well, uh, I do that because, as some of you might know, uh, grief has been given its own diagnostic category uh, this year. Uh, prolonged grief disorder. Uh, it's uh, already recorded in ICD-11, you know, the WHO uh, classificatory manual. Um, and it's exactly precisely uh, because of the fact that grief has emerged as a diagnostic category that I have become interested in that. Uh, I um, have uh, written quite uh, a lot recently about how come we find ourselves in a situation where a phenomenon like grief, which I guess for all of us would be uh, something that would happen to us, so to speak, as a normal thing, uh, is in fact uh, becoming something pathological. Uh, so um, this is exactly an extremely interesting, uh, kind of, um, let's say, historic uh, transformation that has occurred uh, during only the last 25 years or so. so uh, uh, I find that really uh, fascinating. And uh, the reason why I've been interested in, in this is because I actually have focused uh, quite a lot of my time uh, trying to research into the emergence of uh, certain pathologies. Uh, and I use those pathologies as prisms uh, through which we can analyze vital uh, characteristics of contemporary society. Uh, and I do that because of the fact that I think that it kind of reminds us about what it means to be a human being uh, in the society in which we live. So what does it in fact entail to be a human being in uh, present society? That's what I'm interested in, uh, basically. Uh, but I do that from a, a, a quite a specific vantage point, uh, because when I embark on this analytical uh, endeavor, uh, I've always been uh, fascinated uh, by a critical uh, sociology. Uh, and most of all, the tradition that I'm working within is, uh, you know, the German uh, Frankfurt School uh, kind of sociology. Um, and uh, one of the new, uh, I think you could call him the fourth generation Frankfurt School sociologist that I'm really uh, inspired by at the moment is uh, Hartmut Rosa, which some of you might uh, know. 
Um, and I would completely agree with him, uh, and I'm quoting him at the moment, uh, when he states that, quote, uh, analyzing societal changes, uh, we should be aware of what bear the potential for creating social pathologies, i.e. disruptive developments, which cause human suffering and or unhappiness. It is thus, he continues, and I quote again, a central task and responsibilities for social theorists to identify sources of social suffering. And this is actually what I see myself trying to do. Uh, and I kind of uh, underscore trying to. Uh, I, I would like to say that that's what I'm doing, uh, but, uh, but I'd rather say that's what I'm trying to do. So um, this, of course, has an impact on my talk uh, today because I will be relating to this type of work uh, throughout uh, my uh, presentation. But first, I want to mention um, just a few words of why my talk is called It's Hardly Enough to Do OK, Is It? Uh, Mental Suffering in the Performance Society. Uh, the first uh, phrase relates uh, to a focus group interview that I did some month ago with the the PhD student that is actually doing the work that Nicola was uh, mentioning uh, in his presentation. Uh, we did uh, focus group interviews with the uh, university students in Aalborg uh, about this topic. You know, how is it to be uh, a young uh, person today? How is it to be a young university student today? And how does that relate to their, uh, let's say, uh, mental thrivings? Uh, and uh, I, um, I'm sad to say that, uh, you know, they, uh, it doesn't look that good, um, unfortunately. Uh, and the second part, of course, relates to the theoretical prism um, uh, that I'm trying to um, involve you in, uh, which is kind of a diagnosis that I'm doing of the times that we live in a performance society. And uh, it's that prism that I use and try to uh, explain uh, and identify sources of uh, why young people in contemporary society uh, indeed are suffering uh, from various uh, mental malaises. Uh, so this is kind of the theoretical framework that I'm trying to uh, install uh, at the moment. Uh, so I've uh, taken the liberty to uh, make this uh, agenda uh, that you can see on the screen right now. I'm trying to set the scene uh, uh, by um, trying to explain what's on the table uh, and then on the next uh, level, uh, I'll show you some signs of social pathology in contemporary society. Uh, third uh, level would be how to explain mental suffering in the performance society and to use that as a possible explanation about uh, the uh, predicament that we find ourselves in uh, at the moment. Uh, and the fourth level is kind of a question more uh, for you guys. Uh, where are we heading, uh, so to speak? Where's the, uh, where should we be heading, uh, possibly even? Um, so, if we relate to uh, the first part of the agenda, um, there seems to be no doubt about the fact, at least in a, a Danish context, that we, within the last couple of decades or so, have been bombarded uh, with bad news concerning uh, people's mental health, especially uh, young people's uh, mental health. There has been uh, numerous research reports about, uh, you know, how a burgeoning rates and occurrences of specific mental sufferings, such as depression, anxiety, stress, ADHD, AD, I can't say that right now, ADHD, uh, just have been, you know, proliferated throughout uh, society as if there was no stopping uh, to this uh, type of development. Um, and of course, this is instigated uh, I guess all over, uh, you know, uh, the Western world, a lot of uh, public concern uh, and a lot of uh, media attention as well. Uh, and I'm going to show you a couple of uh, uh, those uh, really uh, high profile uh, Danish newspapers, and I will translate what it says about how it is being perceived uh, in a Danish media uh, scene uh, that uh, this proliferation of certain mental malaises uh, has been uh, going on. So from a very uh, high-profile Danish newspaper uh, some years ago, it said 
high school students are just as stressed as the 20 most stressed adults. And then it says something about, you know, the, the, the type of reasons that, uh, that might be uh, involved uh, about uh, this uh, particular, uh, let's say, stress uh, stress crisis uh, as they uh, write about uh, in the article. Uh, and this uh, next uh, slide uh, comes from our uh, broadcasting corporation, uh, the oldest one that we have in Denmark, and the only one when I was a kid, which also says something about my age, I know. Uh, but, you know, it says young people are looking nice on the outside, uh, but more people are hurting on the inside. Uh, and it says, you know, more young people are feeling uh, mentally ill. Uh, you know, there are you know, cracks in the facade and uh, uh, those types of terms, you know, and uh, they are basically uh, struggling too hard uh, and um, the likes. Now, this one is my favorite, I think. Because it's kind of, it's not haha -ha funny, but it's still funny. Uh, it says expert on record low crime, and then you know, young people are instead becoming sick of stress and anxiety. So basically, what it says is that you know, young people today they don't have the time to commit crime. Instead, what they are doing is that they are sitting at home and working too hard on becoming a perfect young uh, people which is, of course, uh, kind of uh, bizarre, but still it says something about uh, what it is that, you know, um, is going on, basically, uh, at least in a, a Danish uh, context. I don't know whether you've seen the same types of uh, references in uh, Belgium, but I guess uh, so. Um, one thing is the media landscape, of course. Uh, the other thing is what, what, what has, you know, been going on uh, within our political landscape of Denmark. And there's no uh, doubt about the fact that within the last uh, 10 or 15 years, uh, across political divides, uh, different politicians, uh, and I have spoken to some of them, uh, really voiced their concerns of how we should address this. How should we understand uh, this? Uh, and just recently, uh, our minister of, uh, from the Ministry of Higher Education and Science pointed at this problem, saying that this was one of her major concerns. And in 2021, this was on uh, top of her agenda. You know, this is really something that we need to do uh, something uh, about. Uh, and then, uh, which I can only appreciate, she says, we need more research. And, you know, as a researcher, I said, well, uh, that's a good idea, you know. Um, and um, even though something uh, needs to be done, uh, what our politician says as well. Perhaps we should pause just for a second. I'll try to do that anyway here, because sometimes, you know, it, it might seem a bit uh, bombastic uh, when we uh, hear headlines like this, you know. Uh, it seems as if that this is something that, you know, uh, actually goes on for the majority of young people in uh, Danish society. You know, they're all mentally ill and, uh, you know, thinking things are basically going down the drain. Uh, which is, of course, uh, not the case. Uh, but I'll try to show you some of the official numbers that the recent uh, research has been uh, kind of pointing out uh, in a Danish uh, context about three different areas that I know that uh, some of you know a lot about. Uh, depression, uh, anxiety and stress. Uh, so you can see the development of what's going on uh, within the last uh, four years or so. So I have to get back to my slides here. So, the extent of mental suffering, the Danish health authorities has created what they call a national health profile. And I'm showing you the numbers from 2017, or uh, actually the development of the numbers from 13 to 17. Uh, I know from uh, my sources within uh, the Danish health authorities that the number is coming out next year, because you see there's a four year interval is going to look, so to speak, even worse than what we are seeing uh, right here. Uh, what you can see on this slide is, of course, that it's uh, basically those between 16 and 24 years old who are actually having uh, enough symptoms, because this is self-reported data, uh, to have uh, 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 depression uh, within, of course, this way of framing it. It's the a major depression inventory that's been used here. Um, uh, some of you know that's kind of a, 
uh, a common used uh, a way of trying to uh, figure uh, out whether people are depressed or not. Uh, what we see and what we've seen for many years is that the development here, uh, especially among women, is something that is becoming uh, from 13 to 17, the proliferation is becoming a, a significant uh, statistic uh, development, you know, so you have 12.3% uh, of uh, the uh, population between that age group who actually report having uh, symptoms of uh, uh, depression. Um, the next is uh, anxiety. Again, the age group between 16 and 24, uh, you only see a rise in the numbers between 13 and 17, exactly the same question they've been asked. Uh, again, the same goes for both men uh, and women, but again, uh, particularly uh, women uh, are kind of uh, in a category where the proliferation of those who report having enough symptoms of anxiety is bigger than those for men. And it becomes a, a more uh, significant, one could perhaps argue, when we look uh, at uh, stress. And here we use Cohen's perceived stress scale. Again, uh, women uh, in the age of uh, 16 to 24, 37.5% uh, of those who uh, asked, answered uh, the survey uh, said, well, mm, they have a significant amount of, uh, of stress symptoms, enough so they could have uh, 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 the score on uh, that. What we know, at least from a Scandinavian uh, context, uh, and uh, I know that from research that's been done by uh, the Nordic Welfare Centre, uh, they have reported in all the Nordic countries uh, an increase in young people suffering uh, from poor uh, mental uh, health. Uh, so it's not only a, a Danish development, I guess it's the same perhaps even for uh, let's say, mid-European uh, context as well. Uh, the big question uh, I uh, am always struggling with is, of course, uh, how are we able uh, to uh, explain this development? Uh, and I want to go through uh, several explanations uh, that are kind of not opposed to the one that I'm offering, but a bit different. Um, so I, I just want to present to you um, some of um, those uh, right now, so you can uh, see that there are other ways of trying to explain that, that the ones I am uh, trying to uh, present uh, for you uh, here uh, today. Uh, I think, uh, from my point of view anyway, some of the most important perspectives that uh, have been, you know, trying to explain this uh, development that I've been showing you uh, here uh, are the following. Um, and I can start by saying that, well, in many ways, uh, and rightfully so, uh, some researchers have talked about how this mirrors the development that I've been discussing, an increasing pathologization of otherwise normal human uh, behavior that has been going on or taken place within the last four decades or so. Uh, and the main reference for this type of work, for me anyway, is uh, Alan Horwich and Jerome Wakefield's uh, extremely uh, important book uh, from 2007 uh, called The Loss of Sadness, uh, How Psychiatry Transformed Normal Sorrow into a Depressive uh, Disorder. Uh, I think that's a vital book in understanding, of course, uh, aspects of this uh, development that I've been uh, talking about uh, until now. Uh, other researchers suggest that, that this development is, so to speak, a side effect uh, of persistent over-medicalization of ordinary human life problems that in so many ways greatly narrows our perception of what normality is. And one of the leading figures within this line of thought is, uh, in my perspective anyway, uh, Alan Francis uh, in his book uh, Saving Normal. Uh, shows uh, how, you know, a big farmer uh, has paved the way for this uh, type of development. Over-medicalization, overuse of uh, antipsychotics, drugs, etc., etc., actually, you know, paving the way for this type of development. 
is his main argument uh, in the book. Others uh, talk about the emergence, uh, and I'm one of those, uh, of a diagnostic culture that not only encapsulates human distress within the realm of a diagnostic vocabulary, but also applies this diagnostic understanding uh, of mental suffering in institutional settings. So this type of understanding has, so to speak, been institutionalized in such a way that the ways in which we perceive how mental distress is actually ordered is nowadays within the confines of uh, diagnostic categories, uh, which of course has made uh, some would say caused serious damage to the ways in which we actually look at each other uh, when we are feeling down or having the blues or something like that. Then it's always by the words of you are either stressed or depressed or you feel anxious and stuff like that. Uh, I can, from a personal uh, perspective, tell you that even my uh, youngest kid, who is four, uh, 13, I was about to forget his age there, he's 13 years old, uh, he uses those terms already uh, as if he knows what they are. You know, he says that schoolwork is stressing, uh, he feels depressed when something is, uh, you know, happening in his uh, video game and uh, stuff like that. And that, of course, has got absolutely nothing to do with the actually uh, mental categories of uh, uh, stress and uh, depression, etc, etc. But uh, it's a development we have to be uh, aware of. And now, um, I, I'm sorry if I'm going to uh, misuse uh, your uh, work, uh, Alan uh, Ehrenberg, uh, but uh, I'm going to quote you uh, now as a, a fourth uh, perspective. Um, and uh, I have to say that this is the one that I've been uh, uh, mostly uh, inspired by, uh, by uh, in my work as well. Uh, you have uh, written a, a very nice article, uh, one uh, where you at a certain point state that what we're actually witnessing, and I quote, uh, is a change in the social, social status of social suffering, not a psychological aggravation of the conditions of individuals in uh, a depressive society. And the ways in which I kind of uh, analyze this is to say that uh, we are seeing a situation in which mental suffering has a different social impact in contemporary societies than it had had in societies prior to ours. But it is not as if we are witnessing a society that are pushing or that is pushing towards, you know, engaging, so to speak, more people in becoming uh, mentally uh, ill. Um, I would like to kind of try just a little bit to question whether that's actually the case, but I'll try to do this as best as I can. Uh, all of these uh, explanations are extremely uh, important to me, uh, and I'll try to get back to them uh, in uh, just a, a minute uh, or uh, at the end of my talk. Uh, but I would rather like uh, now to stress that what I think that these perspectives lack or are somehow not paying enough attention to is, you know, how certain social structural developments have made the proliferation of these mental malaises indeed possible. Uh, or I think I will put it like this. Uh, why is it that our epoch uh, that we are living in right now seems to be particularly uh, hospitable to these types of mental uh, suffering? And this is what I, in the following, uh, would like to embark on trying to explain. And I can, of course, not you know, show you the entire details of this analysis, so I can give you hints, uh, but uh, hopefully uh, these hints and these arguments will be uh, convincing uh, and credible, um, and um, we'll see about that. I would like, however, to make um, some sort of disclaimer uh, about my perspective, because, of course, this is just one perspective. Uh, this is not a question about me having a truth. Uh, I just have one uh, truth, so to speak. Um, so uh, the overarching uh, perspective that I'm trying to make is that we are witnessing the development of, you know, uh, certain social pathologies, and we should look at that through that theoretical prism, 
uh, and see that it is the emergence of what I refer to as a performance society uh, that would allow us to engage uh, in this uh, particular uh, analytical situation uh, that I'm trying uh, to, so to speak, uh, figure out. Um, and by saying that, of course, and using the term uh, social pathology, I need to, uh, let's say, um, try to engage with this concept uh, and what it entails. And as you all know, uh, the concept of social pathology has, ever since it uh, was proliferated and perhaps even popularized uh, by Durkheim, uh, it's been uh, quite controversial. Uh, the mere idea that society as such uh, can be sick uh, and society can cause harm to individual organisms and psyches is not so straightforward. And it has, uh, rightfully so, I would say, been thoroughly criticized. Um, I can't, you know, uh, go into these criticism right here. Uh, rather, I'll try to give an account of social pathologies that fits with my analytical uh, purposes. Uh, and again, I want to use uh, your work, uh, Ian Burke, uh, and uh, quote you uh, on uh, the following ways in which you engage uh, with uh, this uh, concept in a book uh, a colleague and I uh, edited uh, quite many years ago in 2014. Uh, and I'm going to read it out loud. The idea underlying the adjunction of the adjective social uh, to the substantive pathology is that mental pathologies are the product of our social relationships, that they reveal something about our morals and lifestyle, and that it is a moral, social and political lesson to be drawn from this type of pathology. And I couldn't agree uh, more about this way is in which uh, you have dealt uh, with this uh, concept. Uh, however, uh, I have to say that one of those who actually uh, has been uh, quite famous uh, for uh, quite some time uh, on his work on social pathologies is more so, at least in a Danish context, a German social uh, philosopher Axel Honneth. Um, and I think uh, he and his work uh, has uh, done a lot to make this an, an analytically uh, stringent uh, concept. So in a recent article, Hornet, uh, who in his article talks about the diseases of social life, uh, I really like this uh, article, I can only recommend it uh, for you as well if you haven't read it. Uh, in that article, he argues that we need to broaden uh, the analytical scope while using the concept of social pathology. Now, thereby not only reducing it to the negative societal sum of individual members' behavior, social pathologies, he says, might manifest themselves in more collective ways. However, in the mentioned article, uh, he also acknowledges the analytical vigor in focusing on the rise of individual mental suffering whilst analyzing social pathologies. And he writes the following, there would be no reason to give thought to potential diseases of society if the failures of individual socialization did not generally reflect themselves in behavioral abnormalities of the members of society. So, I would totally agree, and I am not at all a favor of reducing the analogies of social pathologies to increasing levels of mental illnesses only. As mentioned, social pathologies might very manifest themselves in other and more collective ways than in individual psychic malaises. That could be rification, alienation, uh, etc., etc. However, and this is vital for my argument today, uh, this is not, uh, Hornet says, uh, the same as to say that we should neglect the analysis of increased levels of individual psychic suffering as sign of social pathologies. And I, in fact, would argue that we need to make these uh, analyses a matter of utmost importance 
especially in the light of contemporary society, where, again, I would claim that in this society, we are trying to reduce particular mental sufferings to individual health problems. That is, there's a widespread tendency in contemporary society to individualize problems that could or perhaps even should, in fact, be seen as structurally stimulated. And it is in line with this reasoning that I'm arguing uh, the following. In our historical epoch, the above mentioned levels of stress, depression, and anxiety are not only manifesting themselves at the seamy side of society for even discursively recognized normality, the bargaining rates of these mental sufferings are also manifesting themselves because of an increasing and even institutionalized societal pressure to perform ceaselessly on all social platforms that people are engaged in, being family, school, friends, social media, work, etc., etc. And this is what I've been trying to do for uh, many years to kind of lay out that type of argument in this book entitled The uh, Performance Society. Unfortunately, it's only out in Danish right uh, now. Uh, and in that book, I made a rather bold statement. I don't know whether it's that bold, actually, but I'm trying to make a rather bold statement that our contemporary society is adequately understood as a performance society. And the ways in which I try to explain that is that within the last 40 years or so, we've witnessed the societal transformation that has completely altered and hence not wiped out, as some sociologists would have it, the social rooms, rules and norms, the, I would say, normative ideals of what it actually entails to be a normal and functional human being within our contemporary society. Hence, the display of certain behavioral and attitudinal qualities are required in order to live up to these ideals, to these normative ideals that have been institutionalized, as I will come back to later. So the suggestion that I'm making is that there is an overarching social logic at stake here. And I think we could define this social logic in the following way. Each member of society should pursue a state of continual performance activity by which she or he is enabled to develop and optimize her infinite potentials for personal growth and self-realization, and I would like to add resilience. Corresponding to this perspective, the ability, I write in the book, to act and conduct oneself in according with this social logic is not only societally imposed, it has also become an identity marker. I'm trying to make an identity category here. So I would say we are, crudely speaking, all bearers of a specific performance identity that we display in various sit settings and develop accordingly. And what is more important, perhaps, is that we are in these settings trying to get recognition for the ways in which our uh, performance identity develops. And only by gaining recognition from that are we able to develop uh, this uh, specific uh, performance identity. Uh, another very uh, analytical, uh, important uh, analytical point uh, in my perspective is that there are certain normative ideals in the performance society, as I've mentioned prior, that have become institutionalized. They have become, uh, I would say, vitally ingrained components in the ways in which we make human beings, i.e. they support the constructions of people's performance identity. That is, they have become institutionalized 
in kindergartens, in schools, in high schools, in universities, etc., just as they have become central fe uh, features in relation to the adaptation of an ever-changing labor market. So these normative ideals have become vantage points of what we might refer to as our continuous employability. Now, the analytical claim that I've been making and I'm trying to make in the book is that we have moved away uh, and beyond from the social logic described in a society of discipline that Michel Foucault so pointedly wrote about. And even further beyond what William H. White described as a social ethic in a collectively oriented society that nurtured belonging as the ultimate prerequisite in his classic book, The Organization Man, which I think dates back to the 1950s. A fantastic book. Uh, again, I would recommend that very uh, strongly. Now, Although we might uh, say that we've left the epoch of docile bodies and organizational men, we have not left the disciplining elements of society behind at all. And this is, uh, of course, very important that we are uh, also in a society of performance, socially disciplined to perpetually perform according to specific social rules and norms. And in that respect, uh, I argue, the internalization of the normative ideals is not optional at all, but a normative, regulatory, even an ethical demand that is almost inescapable. And again, I use uh, Ehrenberg's work to try to uh, explain this, and I hope again I'll do your work uh, right here. Uh, you write uh, in the weariness of the self uh, that this type of uh, human uh, behavior uh, yeah, is uh, kind of ingrained uh, in contemporary society in this uh, way. And why? Well, you say, this is because the modes of regulation are not a choice that each can make in a private way, but rather a common rule valid for all social exclusion being the threat to possible offenders. These regulations are based on our society's general spirit. They are the institutions of the self. So if I understand this correctly, I think I can use this in order to say that in a performance society, then people are urged or even forced to boost their individual performance identity and thereby become and furthermore, socially display what they perform. So they are being institutionalized in that uh, sense. If not, they are socially sanctioned. In Ehrenberg's term, they become socially marginalized or even excluded. Um, still, I have not uh, laid out which uh, social rooms and norms I'm actually talking about. Um, and um, this is a kind of uh, interesting uh, perspective because we know uh, that uh, clear cut definitions of the normative demands that we are witnessing in contemporary society are almost uh, impossible uh, to kind of define uh, in a rigid manner. Uh, in what Hartmut Rosa refers to as a socially accelerating society, uh, this is simply uh, unfeasible. And there's a reason uh, for this. The reason being that then we can use instead rather vague uh, categorizations with which fit, at least this is my uh, view, uh, our contemporary uh, society very well. So we can actually try to see what is socially acceptable and considered recognizable and hence being in accordance with the rationality of the current social logic is the personal responsibility for becoming authentically, creatively and originally better versions of ourselves all the time. And this, how do we go about this? 
Well, it entails the internalization of the following things that I'm going to read out loud for you now. We need to be flexible. We need to be polyvalent, just being able to do several things at the same time. We need to be adaptable. We need to be mobile, connectable, versatile, agile, open-minded, friendly, funny, positive, easygoing, social, brave, and robust, or even perhaps resilient, we can use instead of the word robust. Uh, I don't know what about you, but even reading those things out loud makes me kind of nauseous. You know, it's kind of how do we go about that and how do we even define these terms? Um, and the thing is, perhaps we can't. What does it entail to be flexible? How, what does it mean to be versatile? What does it mean to be a resilient uh, human being in contemporary society? And from what all I've read about these uh, interesting concepts is that it's very difficult to actually, in a stringent manner, define what it is that they entail. It's rather the opposite. It's very easy to define what they do not entail. Of course, there are opposites. But when we go and try to see if we can capture, so to speak, what it means to be flexible, all we know is that we cannot be flexible enough. So there's never an end point uh, to this. We have to understand these concepts as if we are in a process. In fact, an infinite process. We never reach the finish line here. I can never, you know, wake up in the morning and say, well, that's it. Now I have reached my limits for being a flexible, adaptable human being. It, it does, doesn't cut it, does it? It's very difficult anyway. Uh, so we are basically never fully baked, to use a funny term for it. We are never done. We are always in the midst of becoming even more uh, versatile. And the fact that these, uh, you know, concepts have been institutionalized means that we are taught to uh, such an extent that being open-minded, friendly, funny, or positive is something that is ingrained in our institutional setting that's put on us. And put on us in a sense that we are uh, individually responsible for how it is that we become resilient, positive, versatile in those social settings that we have to perform our performance identity uh, in. So we are trying to mold ourselves accordingly uh, all the time. Uh, I would uh, say. Um, however, we have to be aware of the fact that in our society, uh, what a German sociologist uh, Andreas Reikwitz has pointed out in his recent uh, writings, we are constantly being judged or valorized, as he says, by others for our ability to internalize these socially legitimized and recognized demands. Or we are constantly being examined, he says, by others and graded in order to see if we are good enough at being these types of things. So there are certain standards that we have to valorize ourselves towards all the time, namely the recognition of others making us ask these types of questions. Am I good enough? Am I performing well enough? Are my performances up to date? Are they in a situation where I can do better? Am I funny enough? Am I doing this right enough? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we are always, Reykjavits uh, reminds us about, being judged, valorized by others in a tempo that has hitherto never been the case. So there's no doubt about the fact, at least when we're looking from his perspective, that this is constantly being a competitive element of what it entails to be 
a human society, a human being in contemporary society, because we valorize and judge each other on the basis of these. Now, Luc Boltanski and Yves Giappello in their new spirit of capitalism have also pointed out that these normative uh, demands are to be seen and uh, in relation to how we perceive contemporary uh, capitalism. Um, these normative demands they observe uh, are markers of exactly what I mentioned uh, some time ago, namely people's employability, uh, what they refer to as being rather, uh, uh, whether we are categorized as a great person uh, or small uh, persons. So are we actually able successfully uh, to perform our performance identity uh, or are we being sanctioned by others by not being so or are we even doomed so to speak in contemporary capitalist society by not being employable uh, enough it all boils down to our performance identity to add flavor to this demanding task of performing the right performance identity it seems as if there's put uh, it, it is sorry i need some water it seems as if it is put on the same footing as freedom. Uh, as Richard Sennett has written uh, many years ago, we imagine being open to change, being adaptable as qualities of character needed for free action. The human being is free because capable of change. So unfolding our freedom in a performance society is in fact understood as the internalization of these normative demands and we are hereby disciplining ourselves to realizing our so to speak performance potential we can always become better we can always gain better access to another and better performance identity etc etc and in fact this is quite obvious i say that if it's connected with this form of freedom that Senate is referring to, then it's not odd that we are trying to do so. We all would like to be free agents, so to speak, who are taking advantage of the possibilities we can have, etc., etc. So we are constantly trying to achieve this. So all of this, the societal formula for success has you know, of course, negative consequences connected to it. It is highly demanding to constantly trying to be able to perform a better performance identity. As human beings, we need to be extremely robust, particularly mentally in a performance society. And this requires a mental willingness to top tune oneself all the time. It requires inner pliability, flexible inner resources, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And not being able to do this, not being personally able to integrate this social logic of personal freedom, has a lot of social uh, negative consequences. A lack of ability to adequately adhere to these normative demands is not only a breach of this social logic, that is. It is also a breach of one's moral duty to profit from the possibilities of a performance freedom and thus a sign of failed and unsuccessful performance identity. And seen in this light, it's hardly surprising that people on different social levels, of course, try their hardest to comply with these normative demands, thereby appealing to the honor and glory connected with a successful internalization of these. Nor is it surprising, in my perspective anyway, that more and more people perceive this as severely mentally constraining. And this, as I've shown you, seems to go for particular younger people. And, you know, while working on my book, I conducted several interviews with people who fought at this type of society, and they used the term themselves as a kind of chronic stressor which could only uh, in uh, which could sorry uh, account for their uh, poor uh, mental health and a chronic stressor 
uh, a term borrowed from psychology, uh, is definable as an ongoing and difficult condition of daily life that jeopardizes individual mental health. So, in relation to this, uh, to the phenomenon in question, there seems to be four issues at play here that play a significant role. First, it seems almost impossible for the young people to avoid this societal interpolation that we're witnessing in a performance society. Second, the realization of the normative demands is extremely fatiguing. Because what does it mean to be flexible, versatile, polyvalent all the time? It is hardly, it is, it's hardly possible to know, so we just keep on trying. Third, who wants to be a loser? I've written here. Everybody not winning in this type of society, even again talking to the young people according to themselves, are losing out. Fourth, this type of crea society creates permanent insecurity. Where do we go from here? What's happening now? Where should I go with my performance identity? What is best on me, etc., etc., etc. So now this, I mean, is something that kind of signals for me anyway that this type of explanation is one explanation as to why we are witnessing this type of development that I showed to you in the beginning. Uh, I'd like to show to you uh, extracts from a couple of focus group interviews, and I think this is going to be at the end of my talk here, looking at the clock, uh, that I did with uh, university students uh, and uh, something that I did with the CERN, my PhD student on the project that uh, Nicola uh, mentioned. Um, and you know what, what came out of these focus group interviews was really exciting because uh, all of them, you know, which volunteered for uh, engaging in this uh, study, uh, basically told uh, the same story, that during their uh, childhood and their adolescence, uh, they had all, you know, felt uh, the, uh, let's say, bad breath uh, of this uh, performance uh, society. Uh, and the ways in which they explain this, uh, I would say, is uh, really, really, really uh, interesting. Uh, because when I asked them uh, during the interview, uh, so uh, what does it mean for you guys to be uh, a young person in a contemporary society? Uh, this is uh, what they said. Uh, a, B, and C, and A are persons, but, uh, but uh, I can't mention names here, of course. Uh, a tells me, well, um, young people today, it's hardly enough to do OK, is it? And then B says, no, of course not. Everybody knows OK is the same as losing the competition, the same as being a loser. Yes, exactly, she says. We all know that. And we have always been told that this is the case. Then A says again, yeah, and that goes for all we do, especially in school. And then everybody around the table uh, completely nods uh, and saying, well, this is basically uh, the situation that we've been in. So, so the, 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 especially the competitive dimension of the performance society, creating winners and losers uh, is something that they are all uh, completely aware of. And they know which is kind of delicate. They know they can't win all of them, even though they are basically supposed to win uh, all of them. They know some of them uh, will lose out and they know that this will put uh, a really tough strain uh, on them uh, mentally, uh, but still they see uh, no uh, where else to go. Uh, this is the only thing they have, so to speak. And this uh, pressure kind of stresses them. Uh, and uh, sometimes they mention uh, being in a spiral uh, of uh, anxiety and depression uh, all the time. But um, another thing uh, that uh, I uh, got out of uh, these uh, focus group interviews is something that made me even more worried actually uh, and perhaps you'll see why uh, now um, uh, asking them so which type of, uh, of mental uh, stress uh, do you see uh, in this type of society that we're having right now and, and then they uh, engaged in this conversation uh, constantly uh, a uh, not being the same a as before but uh, another group here he, he said well i mean we have all at least most of us experienced stress anxiety or depression 
or someone in our close social circle has. And then B says, yeah, it's normal for us. And she says, well, it is what it is, nothing we can change. And then I became, because I'm the moderator, I became kind of mm, tense. And I said, well, what do you mean normal? And then B uh, answered, well, it's just something we have to, we've come to accept. Not as a good thing, but as something to be expected. And then D joins the conversation by saying, as something so common. And, and that kind of left me baffled uh, because uh, common in, in what way uh, are we uh, really uh, in a situation where uh, young people, I'm not saying that most young people, of course, are uh, thinking this way, but uh, that uh, some uh, young people today think that this is uh, something we just have to go through uh, and uh, levels of uh, stress and uh, uh, depression and the like is, well, uh, normal, you know, because you just have to accept it. Um, and uh, hopefully not, uh, but 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 uh, I've come to uh, kind of a conclusion looking at the numbers of also coming out in 2021 that we haven't been able to alter this situation uh, anyway. Uh, and I think that uh, this type of uh, uh, explanation that I have been trying to give him, uh, to give you uh, here today is some of the, the is not the only explanation, but it's some explanation as to why we're witnessing uh, this uh, ongoing uh, proliferation. And what makes it even worse is, of course, if the institutionalization of the matters that are creating the conditions under which these uh, developments occur uh, has become normalized in the minds of young people uh, today uh, as something they have to uh, deal with and cope with, uh, common, uh, as he mentioned at the end, uh, well, um, hmm. Yeah, I'm uh, a bit sad to say that I think that we will uh, be witnessing uh, these uh, proliferations uh, in the years to come uh, as well. So, and I've been talking very fastly for the last uh, couple of minutes. I am sorry about that, but I'm cautious about the time. Um, well, so where to go from here? If we, and I'm reading out loud here to get, you know, um, the, the right thing that I want to say, if we believe this analysis to be accurate, uh, we're able to discard all the type of explanation. Are we able to discard all the types of explanations that I presented in the beginning of my talk? Well, not, uh, of course not. Uh, we are indeed witnessing pathologization, over-medicalization, a diagnostic culture and a changed status of social suffering in contemporary society. The party explains why we're witnessing high levels of mentoring suffering today. But my contention is that a one-sided focus on any of these perspectives of a matter uh, runs the risk of neglecting the social structural analysis of why young people today feel mentally pressured and hence suffer. And I am very aware of the fact that sociologists such as myself have been criticized for jumping on the bandwagon, proliferating popular ideas and evidence of increasing bad mental health that are in fact are misconstrued. We are, some argue, adding fuel to the fire rather than putting it out. And although I take this critique into consideration, I'm not entirely convinced by it, or I'm more troubled by a societal situation in which this type of analysis should be delegitimized on the account of merely seeing the addressed suffering as banal problems of living, or even unjust individual difficulties, and hence not societally cultivated. That would really worry me. Moreover, I do in fact have the intention of making the young people's utterance, taking the young people's utterances seriously when addressing why they account for being mentally suffering from living in a performance society. Thank you very much for your attention. I think that was about 40 minutes or so. Thank you so much, uh, Anders. It was uh, not only a very, very interesting, but also very lively uh, presentation and very, very pleasant to follow us uh, as far as I am concerned. Uh, a lot to discuss uh, for sure. Uh, I, I, I will um, uh, I will now ask the three PhD students to to uh, to ask their question, and I also would like to 
maybe to hear uh, Alain uh, about this notion of so, uh, social pathology uh, uh, after that, but uh, maybe for the, the, the three PhD students. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the order? Uh, who, who begins? I'm going first normally. Okay, <laughs> Salem, thank you. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Well, thanks so much for your presentation, Anders. Uh, I think it's very refreshing also to have it in English. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes them think in a different way, I don't know. <laughs> so I will be the, the first to ask some questions around Denmark in particular, mm -hmm. followed by mm -hmm. questions more about your theoretical analysis with Genfa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And last but not least, Camille, with questions around the teenager's crisis, identity, etc. Perfect. So as I said, thank you. As mm -hmm. I said, uh, Denmark plays a very important role in the project now, mm. as Michela mm. introduced, mm. Uh, because we actually changed uh, the study we had on Italy for Denmark. Mm. Um, and this is, we, we did that for multiple reasons, but one of them is actually a reason you didn't talk about today, which mm. is good because we can um, mm. talk about that, that Denmark is actually uh, almost always seen as one of the happiest countries mm. in the world. Mm. And that in the three things we are concerned with, so parenting, education and mental health, um, Denmark and Danes can be understood as role models mm. and even moral models to some extent. Mm. Um, to what it's like to be a good parent, a good teacher, a good mm. caregiver. Mm. So a quick example, you have a lot of bestsellers books uh, mm. about how to create the Danish way of life with design, food practices, decoration, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And some of the representation we have of Denmark, at least in mm. France, but I would say in Belgium, it's the same, mm. uh, is that it is a small country. It's a the smallest country of Scandinavia, but it's very peaceful. Mm. And as a sociologist Jenkins says, and I quote, mm. if Denmark is so interesting, it is precisely because nothing ever seems to happen there. <laughs> and of course, <laughs> of course, we know that it is the things that is uh, interesting there because we can clearly see with your researches and your presentation today that actually a lot is happening in, in Denmark. Mm. But anyway, this, this role model of Denmark being one of the most happy, happiest mm. country in the world, mm. etc. Um, it's almost as, as Denmark is playing uh, a part in this idea of seeing happiness as an ideology. Mm. Um, and at the same time, uh, Denmark is also really known, at least in Europe, I would say, uh, for its historical particular practices, which mm. are uh, the practices of Hygge. Mm. Um, I hope I say it right. Uh, you yeah, can correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> but um, Huga can be really roughly described as daily practices of well-being, um, creating comforting, warming atmospheres alone or with loved ones. And I studied Huga for a, a little bit for my master program, and I would like to make some links with uh, Huga and your presentation and research. Yeah. So in your article, um, called Clap Along If You Feel Like a Room Without a Roof from the song, uh, understanding the pursuit of happiness as ideology, which I think Gaspar will come back to uh, later. Mm -hmm. You emphasize the idea that happiness is almost always to be found in the future uh, as it is indeed a pursuit of happiness, a never-ending research, etc. And we can really see the links with that idea of happiness in the future with the fact of the performance society mm. that we are almost never enough. We always have to uh, perform, we always have to uh, evaluate, etc. Mm. And it is commonly said that happiness uh, is not a destination, but it's a way of life. Mm. It's on, on its way that we find happiness. Mm. Um, and in your article, and I, I quote you, and I'm sorry for the irony of the quote, but you say, tomorrow is clean and perfect not yet infested with the germs and bacteria of human intervention. And therefore, the only logical place to position our pursuit and exercise our potential of happiness in an authentic manner, naturally. Mm. And you also say that in a forward-looking performance society, 
who wants to situate their happiness in the past. Mm. And so I was wondering how you would make some links with this idea that happiness is always in the future and that mm. the past is not really a place to find happiness. Mm. It's the actual practices of, uh, of Hugues. Mm. Because actually Hugues seems to be very settled in the present moment. Mm. Mm. Um, even if the past and the future can also be said uh, Hugelit mm. with nostalgia, for example, mm. pictures, etc. And also because, as a sociologist, uh, Lynette and Bin described the practices of daily hygge uh, very close to meditation, mm. and thus for an individual to be both, and I'm sorry for my Danish, uh, Vogen or Venli, mm -hmm. which can mean awake and caring, mm. so caring for ourselves, for the other, and for mm. the environment. Mm. And that is also linked with one other very famous uh, Dane that you probably have heard of, a uh, self-promoted international expert on figure and happiness, actually, mm. uh, Mike Witting, which is CEO of the Institute of Happiness Research in Copenhagen, mm. uh, also defends the idea that, and I quote, Hygge is charged with a strong orientation and commitment to live and rise to the level of the present moment. And so I was just wondering why you did a talk about these practices in your article, maybe in your presentation, I know that you're not only studying Denmark, you're studying mm. the mm. society mm. as a well, whole, but mm. since you are from Denmark, mm. I was wondering. Mm. Um, and also because it is commonly said that Hygge participates in happiness and mm. that it might even be a reason why Denmark is almost always at the top of international mm. rankings mm. regarding mm. happiness. Mm. So do you think that Hygge can be described actually as a performance because it also seems that um, Hygge really, well, fight is maybe a strong word, but it is against this idea of competition because it seems that in Hygge, everyone is equal to, to anybody. So I was wondering how you yeah. would think this idea of Hygge as a performance, mm. uh, what role it could play. Mm. Um, because it is actually meant to be in the present moment and to actually mm. run away from this idea of uh, always looking in the future and always saying, as you say, that we are not enough, but actually to acknowledge that today we are. Mm. And um, so do you think that Fuga is just a collective representation that is indeed never achieved too? Mm. Mm. Uh, and even do you think that Fuga is an ideology? Uh, I have two other small questions. Well, yep. that's more but I think that's answer, a good one. Answer this one first, because of, if I understand you correctly, there are quite uh, a lot of questions within the confines of one question here. Um, okay. uh, and yeah, I'm, yeah. Uh, I'm, um, I'm perhaps not even the right person to ask about the concept of Hugo, because in many ways I dislike it. <laughs> and, and how so? Uh, because it's almost as if it's so uh it, it weighs so heavy on us uh, that uh, everybody who's actually trying to escape so to speak from this idea is a cretin you know uh, and um, it becomes almost boring uh, and it's not but you know uh, being a dane i'm allowed to say that you know so uh, but there's something about it uh, and it's something about, you know, the, the actual fact that Hugo is always almost conventional uh, in a sense that you are not allowed to, uh, you know, go out of the framework set from being in a position where you should, and there's a noun for this, we, now we should Hugo us, eh? we should, you know, do that eh, particular practice of doing that. And that almost entirely comes down to not doing something unconventional. So there's something weird about it. Uh, about the happiness ideology in Denmark, uh, I always understand it as kind of a happiness paradox, because we always kind of, at least in most of the research done on happiness, Denmark is on top of every list you know, and we get really, really uh, mad when we see Norway or Finland, you know, getting better results than us because, you know, we just 
don't like losing out on other Nordic countries, uh, basically. So it's kind of a, it's a branding strategy as well, you know. Welcome to the happiest nation in the world, it said in Copenhagen Airport at some point, you know. And everybody was feel, you know, oh, there's this uh, happy uh, atmosphere. Hygge was one of the things that we got really branded at that time. But it's a paradox because we at the same time see that all of the things that I've been trying to talk about today is occurring at the same time. So whilst being so happy, we still have so many people on antidepressants, so many people, especially young people, who are not coping well with this type of society. And to be a bit mm, polemic, we have within the last 10 years or so tried to do like this, you know, meaning that we're trying to escape from the fact that this was going on at the same time that we live in this, you know, country that's so happy, our welfare state is so well functioning, Hygge, that's something we do on a daily basis, blah, blah, blah. You know, but mm, if you just dig a little bit, then you'll see something that is actually pointing towards another uh, direction. And this is, in fact, what I'm trying to say in the article. Say, well, if we understand happiness as an ideology, as a positive ideology, so to speak, that we are able to pursue, then we need something to get people to actually try to pursue it. There needs to be something that actually pushes people in that direction. But the mere pushing people in the direction of trying to find happiness as something extremely vague is also creating these pitfalls. You know, it's, it's very difficult because then it's not only becomes a moral duty. And then, you know, as I quote uh, Pascal Bruckner for saying in the article, then it becomes, you know, you are, you're scolding on happiness by not being happy. <laughs> which is bizarre, you know? So the, the mere idea of not being happy all the time is doing such a disadvantage to the idea of happiness that we should feel ashamed. And feeling ashamed is something that is really, and I didn't mention that in my talk, you know, a lot of research has been done on that, good colleagues of mine, on shame among young people today. And they're not ashamed of something they do, they are ashamed of all the things that they don't do. Why am I not, when I'm put in a situation where all of these things should in fact be possible for me to do, capable of doing it? That shame is putting a heavy toll on them. They feel inferior. They feel insecure. Useless, even, as many of them use that term. And then, if you have these types of feelings, incorporated, so to speak, in you, it becomes, and now I'm polemic again, damn difficult to hygge. <laughs> How would you be able to do that? You know, so there's so many paradoxes. And, 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 and this is, in fact, I think why Denmark is a good case. And, and also because we have a, actually, you know, and, I, and I'm, I'm not sure that I was, uh, it was obvious enough in my talk, but all of these aspects have, within the last 20 years, become institutionalized in the settings that we, you know, have our children in. It's so obvious when you read, you know, the laws, the context for doing uh, uh, teaching, uh, the ways in which we at universities go about uh, having specific goals for our students that they have to go through all the time. It, it, it's that. It, it's so ingrained, you know. So, so we are putting on, on a narrow track saying, you know, you have all the options in the world, but you have to choose rightly. Thank you. That's uh, Thank you. Uh, so Lynn, maybe I, I, I propose that uh, we uh, go to, uh, to Gaspar okay. right now and maybe uh, if there is some time left, uh, uh, I give you back the, the floor for, for more questions. Uh, Gaspar? I'm sorry yes. if that was too long. No, uh, no, no, answer, that's, uh, that, that's so. fascinating. Uh, so uh, I, I will uh, base my, my questions, uh, or maybe my question, I don't know if I, if, I, if I will have the opportunity to say more than one, but uh, I will uh, base it on the same uh, chapter than, uh, than Solène, the, the chapter you wrote, you wrote in the book uh, Critical Happiness Study, 
uh, the chapter is uh, named Clap Along if you feel like a home without the roof. And in this chapter, you argue that uh, an ideology of happiness has emerged in the wake of the performance society. And you begin your point with uh, a clarification of the meaning of the concept of ideology. So there is two different meanings, you say. Uh, the first is the, the Marxist-influenced one, um, which uh, encompasses the, the idea of, uh, of a false consciousness. So ideology is, uh, in this meaning, all the things that are covering up the, the reality of the relations of, uh, of production. And so uh, ideology has to be understood as a superstructure. And what is a core at this definition is uh, a power-based ontology. So uh, like social relations are ordered along a, a possessor uh, dispossessed axis. The second meaning of uh, ideology encompass the, the, the culturalist uh, one based on the definition of Louis Dumont. So ideology is a set of social uh, representations shared by a group of people we call society. And the ontology here is radically different uh, rather than uh, ontology of powers, uh, of power, sorry. It encompasses the, the idea that there is a, a thing called society that exists uh, at, a, at its own ontological level. Uh, and that is preceding and following its members. So following Alain Cahier, we can argue that uh, this, uh, the, the first definition is individualistic, as it supports the idea that uh, society emerge uh, as a result of a set of individu individuals interested in their own purposes, and that the second is holist, as this meaning implies uh, the existence of a pre-existing pre thing we call society. So you, you rely uh, your analysis on the, the synthesis Boltowski and Chiapello uh, propose of those two meanings of, ideo uh, of the, the concept of ideology. Um, so ideology, uh, following Boltowski and Chiapello, is a system of social representations, uh, represent representations sorry, of uh, which actions are possible or not and acting both as norms and values. So we can do uh, the analogy with the chess game without a set of rules uh, that are norms. It is impossible to play the game of chess and that those rules that are defining chess as chess. So to play the social game implies both that one wants to play and recognizes the rules that characterize, that characterize it uh, as legitimate. So as an example, a, re a revolutionary seeks less to overturn the game board than to change the rules of the game so that it seems enviable to take uh, part in it. And what seems envi enviable for this revolutionary is a system that is both capacitating and normative, which is an ideology. So we can question uh, this definition of a a ideology as it ignores historicity. How can the fact that an ideology is relative, relatively stable through time or more invariable than another at a given point in time uh, be explained other than through historicity? So that, that is the question you answer in the, in the, the, the conclusion of your chapter. Uh, and you, you said it uh, already. The ideology uh, of happiness pulls us towards a goal. Uh, because our social definition of happiness makes it an, an enviable thing. Uh, of course, who do, does not want to be happy? But the heart of your thesis is that uh, there is a, a paradox in the realization of happiness because the, the realizations of happiness performances is uh, unevenly distributed. So this is the paradox you point out. You point out uh, why do we keep trying? Why do we still believe in happiness? And the answer you give to this paradox is that our social meaning of happiness is intricate with the with the, our concept of freedom. So I quote you in this article, only by pursuing and exercising one's potential for happiness is one free, and who wishes not to be free? So you answer the question why, but not the question how. How is it possible to explain that it is this peculiar ideological combination, uh, happiness and freedom, that has spread and stabilized and not another? And you argue that uh, this combination, happiness, freedom as ideology, emerges in the wake of the transition from a disciplinary society to what you call a performance society. 
so you uh, you extend uh, the the meaning that uh, Foucault gave to this concept that, it, that that you judge limited, and I totally agree with you uh, because it only uh, it only take into account the distortive aspect of discipline. So you said uh, rather than focusing on aspects of discipline only. The more potent question to ask is how the society of disciplines also involves opportunities of realizing individual autonomy. But, and this is my question, what stands beyond this notion of autonomy? Uh, if it is not terms that refers to individualism as an ideology, so aren't opportunities of realizing individual autonomy, I quote you, parts of a value system that places individuals uh, as the top value? Or, in order to say it in other words, is there an ideology of happiness or is happiness a combination value norm of the individualist ideology? And if so, does this not imply that ideology of happiness as a combination of the values of freedom and happiness emerges in the concept, in the context, sorry, of a particular type of individualism? So if this ideology of happiness did not emerge before the rise of the performance society, it means that the fact that a peculiar form of individualism exists was a, uh, a condition sine qua non for its rising. So at this point, uh, if we accept this and following your demonstration, we should have at least two types of individualisms. One relates to the disciplinary society and another to the performance society. The first preceding temporarily the second. And uh, it is in this second type of individualism that arises the ideology of happiness. And so this is my second question. Uh, and the last one, uh, as people in disciplinary societies also adhered to happiness, does this imply the existence of multiple type of ideology of happiness in the wake of different types of individualism? And thank you. Thank, thank you. you uh, uh, I'm uh, just becoming a you're very aware of the fact that I'm uh, using a lot of uh, French sociologists uh, whilst talking to uh, French-speaking people. Uh, and I'm perhaps doing uh, myself a disfavor in <laughs> that being the case. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, I think I understand uh, your question uh, correctly. Uh, and I think my answer is the following, or I know it is. Uh, the, the ways in which I try to argue in that art in, in that article, and, and I'm very aware of the fact that this argument is not, you know, solid, solid, but it, I'm trying to make an argument. The difference between the types of understandings of happiness that we are witnessing within the realms of these two types of society is what makes this interesting for me. And I'm, of course, focusing on the second one, that one being performed in a performance society. And I think we can understand it by saying that this type of happiness and the ideology that I'm trying to explain is what one perhaps could call a hedonistic type of happiness. A hedonistic in the sense that it requires each individual to get as much pleasure as possible out of their daily lives as is humanly possible within the confines of what this society offers to you. And if society, so to speak, offers a lot on different shelves, but the fact is that you have to choose the right shelf in order to reach this type of happiness, then it becomes a responsibility for you to choose rightly. Then happiness also becomes a choice. It's a choice of your making. And if that's the case, then the type of individualism, uh, and I think, or at least I'm trying to make that argument, that adheres to that is a kind of individualism that puts the idea of authenticity and autonomy at the very top of the wish list, so to speak, of what it means to be a human being in contemporary society. And those type of wish lists, so to speak, were different in earlier types of society also relating to different types of what we could understand as happiness then. And I think that there's put, put all a lot of focus on and perhaps even turbo on these types of hedonistic understanding of what uh, happiness is today in our type of society in which, of course, individualism is equal with, I would say, 
the ability to perform authentically in your autonomy to become a particular type of performance identity all the time. This is the only way in which, and I'm doing like this, this is the only way that you can actually achieve this type of happiness in contemporary society, leaving out a lot, of course. A lot is being put on the sidetrack if this is the case. And it is exactly the sidetrack that I'm interested in. You know, so, so what, what's, how do we define the sidetrack of today? Is this just the opposite of what it means to be this type of performance, uh, identity, person, all the time? Da, 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 da? Or is the sidetrack, in fact, cultivated by different aspects that we can also see in contemporary society? How do we understand that? And I'm not sure that I've given the right understanding, but I'm trying to at least merge these two together. Mm -hmm. uh, and th that's why I think that, that the idea of paradox comes into my mind as well. Uh, again, you know, it, it's 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 a conundrum. You know, uh, that, that how how is it? At least in I, I think in in a, in a Danish concept, it, it is as if we've been surprised by this. It almost comes as a surprise to us when we look at these type of analysis. And most, you know, people, and I'm doing a lot of public talks in Denmark, they look at me and say, oh, is this the case? You know, I say, yeah, you know, just look at the ways in which and we can see this type of development. If you look at the ways in which we do these types of things in our institutions, this is what we get. And, and, and they know it without knowing it, so to speak. <laughs> which is interesting. And they also know that the pursuit of happiness as this type of ideological endeavor requires their activation of this type of performance identity. I'm not sure if that was a correct answer for your question, but this is the answer I came up with. Well, at Thank least you. it's a fascinating answer and uh, um, also underscores the, the, the importance of a comparative perspective about what we say uh, yeah, about definitely. Denmark. Thank you. Uh, Camille? Uh, yes, uh, I'm here. Uh, so, um, as Nicolas, Solène and Gaspar uh, already said, thanks uh, a lot, uh, Anders. Uh, it was fascinating. Uh, more that uh, we know that my area on the project is uh, mental health and so it was really great uh, to hear from you and to learn more about uh, Denmark's. So thanks, thank you. Um, so while I was reading your article, Depression, Diagnostic and Suffering as Process, I found some interesting ways to link the concept of diagnosis as process to the concept of teenagehood as a model of misconduct developed by uh, Chebeli, and to the question about rights and socialization of evil promoted by Ehrenberg. And I would like to share my reflection with you today, but uh, I don't know about the time, so uh, if uh, Alain Ehrenberg wants to react, maybe I won't, I will give uh, more time and I just uh, will talk uh, about um, Chebeli article. But so, <laughs> Um, in your study of depression, you are interested by young people and their particular way of reacting to it. Entering the teenagehood is like entering the period of transition of metamorphosis. And as you said, in a crossword life where identity, education, sexuality, family formation and friendship present themselves in a particular pressing manner. Since the 15th century, the, this period has been taught on a period, uh, as a period of transition. But since the 20th century, the notion of crisis characterized uh, these times. In modernity, the definition of crisis uh, uh, given, given by Eggers make all its sense. A crisis is a period of time that marks the birth and the passage of uh, in a, in a new period that plays the individuals in the work of his own transformation. So in the age of reflexivity and interiority, and as you uh, said uh, just uh, now, in the performance society, young 
people who does not find meaning in his life, who does not, not achieve the challenge of the metamorphosis, will enter in a teenage wood crisis. This reflection raises the question of whether this crisis can be seen um, into the diagnostic process as you describe it. Uh, is the diagnosis process replacing the teenage root crisis for some individuals? We can see that diagnosis is becoming more and more involved in the self-construction of identity. Knowing that today individual are so on the continuum between weakness and strange, that every person can one day or another suffer from a psychological disorder, such as depression, which is one of the most whispered, and that, as you said, uh, there is a tendency to romanize depression and the culture of diagnosis in the middle and upper classes. So, do young people go through the identific identification of suffering in order to construct themselves? By this question, I would like to understand how the diagnosis and the adolescent crisis can be linked or dislinked in the process of identity construction. My second reflection starts from the Devereux directive that I found in Chebelis works, which is beware of being crazy, but if you become crazy, behave in a good way. <laughs> Chebelis thinks of the teenager's crisis as a model of misconduct. According to the author, sometimes culture provides explicit guidelines for the misuse of cultural materials especially in frequent and atypical stress situations. I then ask the, follow the following questions. Is the psychic suffering of teenagehood also driven by a societal desire to frame madness? Can we think of diagnosis as process like a model of misconduct, a societal model of the management of suffering that we could summarize by this sentence? If you are not feeling well, it can be okay, but behave healthy anyway. So, so I don't, I don't know. Maybe you can first answer to the those two reflections because they are really linked. And mm -hmm. after, if we have time, I can maybe uh, uh, go uh, about my last reflection. Yeah, uh, but I'd like to. Yeah, I, I think this, all of them have been really uh, good questions. Um, if I understand correctly, is this? You, I think you said, is this a societal modeling of behaving? crazy that we are witnessing right now that is different mm -hmm. from prior ones is, is that the, the, the question yeah and and i would definitely say yes uh, i mean and, and who are then telling us what it means to behave crazy if we should put it in that way uh, in 1995 i think it was a very important book came out say uh, they say you are crazy uh, an ethnography into the diagnostic world of DSM, um, which was uh, fantastic in the sense that it, it showed the social construction of diagnosis. Hmm? Uh, so uh, what happens actually, you know, besides all the research that's going on in order to, to make a diagnosis is also the fact that, you know, psychiatrists are gathering at conventions uh, and they are talking about which symptoms should you be put in uh, to the various uh, diagnoses. And uh, sometimes they, uh, you know, they uh, raise their hand and I say, uh, yes, I think this should be uh, in and uh, no, I think this should be pulled out. And then uh, they come to a kind of a, an agreement. I'm putting this, uh, you know, uh, crudely, but, but it, it's it exactly the case. This type of construction is societally molded. It's not without any reference to the norms, the social structures, uh, the cultural persistence of society outside the hallmarks of psychiatry. You know, so it's not just within psychiatry that they are able to decide what counts as being crazy, so to speak. We need to take the other stuff into consideration as well, otherwise we don't understand it. Hence, we also need to take the societal development into consideration, the historic development of society. This is why we can have different and various types of craziness 
relating to different historical epochs, I believe. So, the first question, is there a type of self-construction as well going on amongst young people in relating to these types of malaises that I mentioned in the beginning, let's say depression, anxiety, stress, et cetera, et cetera. Is this a way of relating to a teenage crisis as well? And I think partly that's right. I think that the vocabulary of these types of sufferings have become so ingrained in people today that they also use them as an aspect of, as kind of an epistemic construction, you know? So they are defining themselves on the grounds of that. So people in Denmark, they are not saying, for example, uh, I feel busy. No, I'm stressed. Mm -hmm. You know, am I having a, a, a bad feeling in my tummy? No, I'm anxious. Am I down or do I have the blues? No, I'm depressed. And a lot of young people are using these types of vocabularies in order to understand themselves, but more importantly so, in order to understand others. You know, so they look at their peers and they say, okay, you look as if. It seems as if you feel depressed. It seems as if you feel anxious. It seems as if you feel stressed and stuff like that. So there is an element of self-destruction, construction in it. But again, I would argue, where have they been given these types of vocabulary from? We need to understand that element as well. It's not something that just, you know, came down from the sky one day and said, whoa, pop, here you go. No, it's been created. And the possibilities of these types of construction, so to speak, have been created as well. Ingrained, internalized. Mm -hmm. And this is the only way I think we can understand this process thoroughly. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the, those uh, exchanges. Um, we have two participants that are very much used to teams and who knew how to raise their hands, uh, Alain and uh, Cécile. So I give the floor to Alain for his question. Uh, thank you, Nicolas. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you, Andrews, for your very interesting uh, presentation. You gave us a global perspective. And uh, thank you also for the conversation with me. A simple example of the importance of mental health. In France, the Ministry of uh, Health uh, just said that we are going to be uh, confronted with the third wave of the coronavirus, which will be the, the wave of psychiatry and mental health. But uh, I only... Uh, I wonder about the, the idea that the uh, society can be sick and the idea of uh, hornet. And so uh, there are social pathology uh, related to this uh, sick society. I, won't, I, I think uh, we can shift a little the, the approach. Uh, I, I, I would rather say that we have uh, attended, attended transformation of ways of acting and living, and simultaneously we are assisting of transformation of ways of being affected. So it goes to, to, together. So the idea that uh, society is pathological uh, prevent to see that, uh, uh, that aspect. And in the society of performance, of course, autonomy dominates the, the landscape. And of, we are in a society which is very demanding on the level of self-control uh, of emotions. But what I'd like to add is uh, this society uh, uh, offers new opportunities but also creates uh, new tensions in the same time, and these tensions uh, uh, express uh, themselves in the language of mental health. But regarding uh, this new social pressure, uh, I think you should uh, 
uh, highlight the idea that there are also social supports. Uh, individuals are not uh, abandoned to themselves. Uh, and this, uh, the, the social supports are not only therapy. For instance, if I take the case of Denmark, uh, flexi security is the type of social support we are in need in a society of performance and autonomy. And for France, uh, I think flexi security would be a, a, a model to reform uh, social protection in this age of autonomy, performance, globalization, uh, uh, etc. Because uh, it's uh, secure as uh, professional trajectory. And we have some public ac action in this direction, this direction in France. For instance, the, uh, uh, there was a reform of vocational training uh, on the Holland, and it, it was uh, uh, continued by uh, by Macro. And it goes in this direction to securize uh, individual uh, trajectory because trajectory are, are uncertain today. So it was the the remark I wanted to, which came to my mind uh, yeah. Yeah. in uh, listening to mm. your speech. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and, and and I think I think you're right um, uh, that I am perhaps. Uh, uh, focusing a bit too much on one side instead of also being aware of the other side of this uh, development that we are trying to uh, understand that uh, there is a social pressure but there is also a social uh, support uh, side uh, as well that we need, that we have to be uh, aware of and um, Although there's a lot of uh, internal critique in Denmark about the flex security model, uh, I'm aware of the fact that it could be a, a good model for uh, other uh, countries uh, to uh, pursue. Um, what I've been trying to at least say uh, is that even, you know, in some aspects, the social support side in the type of society that I'm trying to uh, define uh, is also uh, a support that is only supportive if you support yourself in trying to adhere to the ideals uh, of this type of uh, society and hence making that uh, uh, an element of uh, some sort of pressure as well. But perhaps uh, I, would, uh, I would agree with you, perhaps I'm, I'm leaning towards too much focusing on this element of the, uh, the support side. So, so thank you very much for, for pointing that uh, out for me. And if the, the, the social pathologies uh, prism, so to speak, prevents me from uh, witnessing these types of uh, transformations uh, as well, uh, then um, clear uh, that is something that I uh, have to be aware of in uh, the, the following work. Uh, but but, but, but I'm, I'm still trying to come to terms with a type of society that in my perspective uh, kind of produces uh, these uh, type of ailments. Uh, that I'm, um, I'm talking about here today, and and but but yeah, uh, you always have to be uh, analytically, uh, let's say, nuanced, uh, and uh, uh, and if there's a lack of uh, of that here, uh, that they, then uh, of course I have to be aware of that. So thank you very much again for your uh, comment. Thank you, Alan, Anders, uh, Cecil, and welcome once again. Thank you. Do you hear me? It's okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super. Um, so thank you. The, uh, I thought it was really, really uh, fascinating. Uh, here, here also in Quebec, uh, there is a strong debate about um, uh, youth and mental health, and especially about medication, because uh, new data show that uh, mental health medication is more and more given. Uh, for teenagers, but even more for children now, uh, in families, but also in schools. And so there is a new social movement, Jeunes et Santé Mental, Youth and Social uh, and Mental Health, uh, which uh, wants uh, to promote uh, less individual, individualized answers to that problem and more uh, social, uh, structural uh, answers. And my question was more uh, theoretically, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, um, about uh, 
how do you articulate the concept of performance and the one of uh, economic and social competition? Uh, when you uh, stress about performance society and the social and normative demands, you insist a lot about individual qualities, um, uh, flexibility, adaptation, etc. Um, and uh, I would like to know uh, how do you place um, uh, uh, the fact that uh, these uh, um, qualities are always evaluated not only in a conversation from self to self, I think, but also and much more in a conversation from self to others. In uh, my interviews uh, on young adults, uh, the, the, the place of social competition uh, and this, uh, re, um, this look of my place in a social scale and uh, compared to others is really a factor is really seen as a factor of mental health. Mm. And so how do you link both? Because both mm. are interacting mm. Mm. Uh, to explain yeah. mental health uh, mm. to majors, uh, mm. among teenagers. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this uh, important question, because this is really, really something that uh, needs to be uh, stressed. Um, when I used the German uh, sociologist uh, Andreas Reikwitz and his focus on the ways in which we need to be recognized, so to speak, for the performance identity, that we are performing towards others. It's, uh, an, uh, it's a social act where we always do that in competition with others, uh, which is extremely uh, important to stress if I didn't do it in my, in my talk, because you see the other as something that is trying to do exactly the same as you, and you always want to be a chat ahead of that person. You know, so what are your competitive strengths? And of course, we know that this is an economic discourse that we are talking ourselves exactly. into and that we are being talked into as well. So, so the ways in which, so to speak, ca competition plays a vital role in our understanding of what capitalism is as well, you know, mm. is of course supportive, I would say, of this argument that the competition is something that we are doing towards each other. So in schools, for example, in Denmark, you know, uh, uh, something that I'm, I'm writing on right now, people, the, the pupils are not only seeing themselves as part of a classroom, they are also in competition with each other. And why? Because the institutionalized values to which they have to adhere focuses on that. <laughs> so, so there's no wonder. You know, it's, it's kind of blatant, obviously, that that's going to be the case. So is it really out front, out loud all the time? No. But do they notice it? And are they able to talk about it when you, for example, interview them? Yes. Not without a doubt, you know. If I do not do this, they others, and this is where exactly... And, and I've been, again, uh, really, uh, how do you say that? Something that uh, you wrote about many years ago, uh, Alain, as well, about sports metaphors entering our society. You know, it's a competitive edge. You know, you are a better player than the others. You know, all this stuff enters into their vocabulary. It's been ingrained, which is, again, it's weird, you know, but I think that's happening, at least in the Danish. And this is where the social competition aspect comes into the picture as well. And this is, of course, where social media, of course, enters into the picture as well, because that's a major competition ground, you know, and it's, it's so, it happens so quickly. So the speed of it as well is all the time. I don't know whether that was Thank a good you. answer, but that's... Oh, yes. Thank and you know, you, you can see so this is something that really, it, it kind of gets to me as well, because it, 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 it's, it seems so obvious. And still, it's such a big thing. It's, it's so difficult almost to... It's like a, a, a huge boat that we need to turn, you know, but it's, it's just moving in, the, in one direction. And we, as sociologists, can do like this, come on, you know, turn, turn. <laughs> Uh, nobody listens to us, you know. So. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thanks, a, thanks a lot. Unfortunately, time is uh, running so fast out. Uh, maybe a, a, a last conclusive question from uh, Eva, 
with a PhD student and a teaching assistant uh, here at the Casper, mm -hmm. Eva. Yeah, so. Oh, wow. I have no idea if it's going to be a conclusive question, but I have it to has to. <laughs> yeah. OK, uh, so I um, first of all, thank you for this wonderful and thought provoking uh, presentation. Uh, I feel like, you know, I've always been very fascinated by young adulthood because the stakes are so high, because not only you have to act as your authentic self, but you also have to find out what that authentic self is. Mm. And that's the I mean, the stakes are very, very high at th this moment. So I just my question is, how do you perceive this crucial period of choice in Denmark? Do you feel there are specific aspects in your country, uh, such as um, I don't know, a competitive higher education market, for example, that could either worsen or lessen the stressful aspects of young adulthood? Mm. Thank you. A very to the point question, is there something to be done to lessen the burden of young adulthood in Denmark? And I would say uh, yes. And something would actually, uh, within the confines of uh, legislation, uh, very easy. Uh, but uh, in 2013, we had a new school reform uh, in Denmark that put a major strain on how uh, pupils should be taught in school. What is it that they needed to learn? And uh, some of my colleagues are talking about uh, a new type of learning ideology, <laughs> which is kind of uh, funny. Uh, but that ideology, they say, focused on one thing only, and that's what are we able to evaluate? What are we able to uh, make goals out of? And what are we able to see as progress? Some of these evaluations, some of these goals, some of these ways of viewing what progress is could be lifted out of the legislation very easily and making all these types of evaluation that young adults have to go through all year long and just get rid of them. Because we know that they feel as if it's putting a even bigger strain on them than they are already under. So I, I, I would say yes. And if you then, of course, you have to take into consideration that this is a political uh, dimension as well, and you need to get the political parties involved agreeing with that type of argument, then it is not so easy. But in itself, things could be done. Uh, and, you know, very easily. So what and, and I'm not the only I'm, I'm, I'm not just saying that. Uh, I, I was invited to be part of a, uh, a project by uh, a Danish healthcare uh, organization, and they spoke with young adults in the numbers, and they almost all of them mentioned these particular strains, evaluations, goals they had to adhere to all the time as something that really, you know, oh, put them off. And if you talk to them, they also say, well, it would be very easy not to, you know, be part of that uh, thing all the time. We could just get rid of it because it doesn't change the ways in which we deliver, so to speak, in school. So, so by habit. Thanks. Th th thank you once again, uh, Anders. Uh